are so honored to have Gareth Porter with us today. Um, he was the 2012 recipient of the prestigious London-based Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism. And because we are, uh, uh, because WAM, Women Against Military Madness, is a women's organization, I just want to mention that Martha, Martha Gellhorn received the prize for um, being the most important journalist in the 20th century from the Madison Gellhorn um, Prize for Journalism. It's a, it's a journalist, journalist prize. Uh, it's a journalist, journalist prize. <laughs> And um, WikiLeaks received it in 2011. So that's, that is um, really an honor. Um, and it, it is awarded for uh, a journalist who reveals an unpalatable truth validated by powerful facts. So we do have someone who, who meticulously uh, scrutinizes facts put them together for us. Um, uh, Garth is a news analyst for Interpress Service, IPS. You may have seen his writing there. Uh, or also, he's published on Truth Out, Huffington Post, Al Jazeera, English, Counterpunch, Salon.com, and other places. Uh, through investigation as well as a historical lens, he's debunked a lot of propaganda and examined uh, U.S. policy that is developed with the intention of waging war from out Southeast Asia, where he was at one time a Saigon bureau chief during the Vietnam War. Um, and Cambodia and Korea he's also covered. He actually is a scholar as well. He has a PhD in um, Southeast Asia studies. Um, and he's also reported on Afghanistan about the manipulation of intelligence in order to provide a rationale for a military attack on Syria. And in his talk, based on his book, Manufactured Crisis, The Untold Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare, uh, he uh, will address what he found after an intensive dissection of allegations about Iran's nuclear program. This is particularly timely right now because the talks between the three, uh, P5 plus one, that's the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, the US, China, Russia, France, the UK, and uh, plus Germany, will be uh, talking with Iran. To, they'll re be resuming their talks May 13 about the supposed nuclear weapons that Iran has. And so it's, it's really important um, for us to hear him and be able to hear him tonight. Um, he is going to examine the premises that these talks will be based on. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Garrett. Thank you so much, Mary, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight uh, to, uh, to hear what I have to say about the issue of U.S. policy toward the Iranian nuclear program. As Mary, Mary's introduction suggested, I have been uh, writing about issues of war and peace for quite some time, going back, of course, to the Vietnam War, and in fact, um, as I look back on what I've done over that the last few decades, uh, I realized that really almost from the beginning, uh, I would say effectively from the beginning of my interest in issues that have to do with U.S. war, I was really doing investigative journalism. Um, I was putting together the pieces of the puzzle to try to reveal some bigger realities that were being concealed from the American people and from the rest of the world. And, and I'll tell you, the, the thing that I, I feel proudest of in my life up to now is that I was the one who pointed out, beginning in 
1969, continuing through the end of the uh, Vietnam War, that the, uh, the Nixon administration, Richard Nixon himself specifically, was lying to the American people when he said that unless the United States government keeps troops in Vietnam uh, for many more years, the communists will kill hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese. And I delved into that uh, issue of the bloodbath. You all remember the bloodbath. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the single rationale, really, for continuing the war in Vietnam from 1969 to the end of the war. And it was indeed a lie, and I, I was able to point out on the basis of careful scrutiny of the facts, of the historical facts, that there was no record of a bloodbath after the first Indochina War, the Vietnam War against the French, uh, and that there was actually a campaign of disinformation that had been carried out uh, during the U.S. war in Vietnam, in which they paraded a former Viet Cong colonel before the news media and had him make statements indicating that there was a plan by the communists to carry out this bloodbath against their enemies after the war. Well, it just so happened that I had possession of many pages of a long interview with that same ex-Viet Cong officer a few years earlier, in which he did not say a single word about the plan of the communists to carry out revenge against them. So it was very clear that there was uh, this massive disinformation campaign, and that, that was really the first time that uh, I was involved in this um, kind of investigation of a major uh, disinformation, piece of disinformation by the U.S. government. But I have to tell you that when I went to work on this issue for manufactured crisis, I discovered that the scope and the degree of success, the degree of credibility that was achieved by the Bush administration and their Israeli uh, colleagues, their Israeli allies, in putting forward this notion that Iran had always wanted and lusted for nuclear weapons uh, virtually from the beginning of the Islamic regime, and had carried out a secret nuclear weapons program, that the success of this myth, of this false narrative, uh, is really much greater than anything that had been propounded during the Vietnam War. Or indeed, with regard to the Iraq War, you're all familiar also, of course, with the way in which the United States was lied into war in Iraq using uh, false intelligence, intelligence that was really bogus about um, alleged efforts by the Saddam Hussein regime to get weapons of mass destruction. And that was proven very quickly when they went into Iraq and they saw there were no weapons of mass destruction. So that bit of false narrative completely collapsed very quickly. But this, this false narrative, which has made up the manufactured crisis on the Iranian nuclear program, has not collapsed. And indeed, it has grown stronger. I'm sorry. Um, there are two different mics here, and I, I've forgotten that I was not just speaking into one. Um, <laughs> try to be careful. But uh, the point I'm making is that uh, 
This uh, false narrative surrounding the Iranian nuclear program has only grown stronger over the years. And I'll try to explain to you tonight why it is that, in fact, as time has gone by, this lie has gained in power and credibility instead of losing uh, its credibility. But first, let me explain something about the cover of my book. Many of you will wonder, why would I bother to put the puss of Bibi Netanyahu on the cover of my book? And the reason, of course, is that this is the iconic image of Netanyahu in his speech at the United Nations in September of 2012, in which he used this cartoon bomb, which was likened by many to the cartoon bomb in the Roadrunner cartoon, <laughs> um, uh, which, which only succeeded, in fact, in convincing most uh, of the people who paid attention to what he had said. Uh, in, in believing that he had managed to make a joke out of a serious issue. And so, in a way, it is uh, appropriate to uh, illustrate my book, to have a moment in this long history of the, uh, the nuclear scare, uh, which was uh, propounded by the uh, US government and uh, the Israelis a moment in which that nuclear scare seemed to kind of fall on its face. Um, but nevertheless, the intention was very serious. The intention was to convince the world that Iran is in the final stage, that red line representing the final stage of uh, getting the enriched uranium necessary to build a nuclear weapon. And of course, that was all uh, that was all <laughs> a, a product of the fevered imaginations of the people who were working on propounding this false narrative. So uh, let me now go back to really the centerpiece of this book. The, the central uh, narrative of my book is the story of how the neoconservative, the small group of neoconservatives in the Bush administration, working with the Israeli government, in fact, laid the groundwork for what they believed would be an eventual war with Iran by creating a set of false documents which would then be used to convince the American people and the rest of the world, particularly the Europeans, that Iran was indeed a danger to obtain nuclear weapons and that they couldn't be trusted and that therefore the United States would have to intervene. And of course the real reason for this uh, effort to create the false narrative, to go to such lengths to create that narrative, was that the neoconservatives, along with the Israelis, were bent on regime change in Iran. That was their objective. This was part, of course, of a much broader policy of not the Bush administration per se, but more precisely that neoconservative contingent in the Bush administration to carry out regime change on a wide scale across the face of the Middle East. In fact, the objective was to remake the political map of the region. And specifically, the plan was to carry out regime change in five countries, starting, of course, with Iraq, with the US invasion, the overthrow of the Saddam Hussein regime, and the occupation of the, of the country, the, specifically the occupation of some, several major military bases which would then be the basis for a broader regional military uh, strategy of threatening to use force or actually using force against four other countries. And those four other countries would include Libya, 
Somalia, uh, Libya, Somalia, uh, Syria, and of course, finally, Iran. And Iran was to be the prize that would be won at the end of this process. And they assumed that it would take longer uh, to, to uh, achieve the goal of regime change in uh, Iran. But that that, of course, would be the primary achievement of the Bush administration. Uh, and of course, the war never happened. We know there, would, there was not a war against Iran, but it was not because the, the neoconservatives and their Israeli allies did not expect it and plan for it, and indeed carry out the strategy that was aimed at them. The reason that there was never a US attack on Iran was very simply that the resistance to the US occupation in Iraq was so much more effective than had been expected by the people who had planned that war, had planned the occupation. In fact, of course, they didn't really expect to have to fight a war in Iraq. And so their plan was completely discombobulated by the fact that there was indeed a very effective resistance to the U.S. occupation, particularly in the Sunni triangle, in the Sunni uh, region of the country, to the degree that the U.S. military by 2005 was very explicit about saying, in many cases publicly, that this war is not working. <laughs> the, more United, the more Iraqis the U.S. military kills, the more enemies they and so it was that the U.S. failed so utterly in its war in Iraq that uh, it became impossible to pursue the strategy, which was, after all, to use the U.S. control over these military bases in Iraq to then extend the power of the United States through threat as well as continued extension of military operations beyond Iraq into the rest of the Middle East. So I think we should all uh, uh, be thankful to the Iraqis for having saved the United States from a war with Iran. And uh, so, so uh, then let us look at precisely how they did this, because I think this is really the most fascinating part of the tale that I tell. What was uh, planned here was a, uh, a series of developments that would convince uh, the American people and the rest of the world that the Iranians intended to get nuclear weapons as soon as possible. And, and we're going back now to early Bush administration specifically 2003-2004. It's in that period that I'm able to document in the book the neoconservatives in the Bush administration in Israel together planned uh, to create a set of documents which would purport to portray a secret Iranian nuclear weapons program. That is a program of research related to nuclear weapons. And in the purported, uh, the documents purporting to show this nuclear weapons program, one of the things that would be portrayed is a whole series of designs or, or efforts to redesign the reentry vehicle of the Iranian Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile, the Shahab-3. This is a missile that had a range of roughly uh, 605, 600 miles. It couldn't reach Israel, okay? It was falling very far short of the deterrence needs of the Iranians. But what was shown in these drawings, which ultimately they never surfaced, they were never shown publicly, we've never seen them, but they've been described 
by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And what was shown in these, uh, in these pictures, these studies, was an effort to redesign the reentry vehicle so that it could accommodate a nuclear weapon. It wasn't explicit that it was a nuclear weapon, but it was left so that one could hardly draw any different conclusion. So that was really the sensational, the most sensational piece in this set of false documents. Uh, the documentation was quite extensive, uh, supposedly as many as a thousand pages of documentation. And it was all together. And according to the story that came out later, these documents were found on the laptop computer of one of the scientists in this Iranian nuclear weapons research project. So you can imagine how sensational that story was when it was leaked to the news media and published in 2005, 2006, 2007, a series of, of leaks that effectively created the storyline that Iran had, in fact, been carrying out the secret research program in which they were trying to mate a, the nuclear weapon with their Shahab 3 missile. Um, now, let's look at exactly what did happen, in fact. Um, this is the story that I reveal in the book, which has never been published anywhere else. Uh, I was able to get an interview with a senior German, a former foreign office official, a senior German, former foreign, foreign, foreign office official, excuse me. And in the interview in 2013, uh, this former official, who had been in charge of US, German, cooperation, so it was, it was a high-ranking official in the foreign office, told me that in November of 2004, he had been contacted by high officials of the German intelligence agency, the BND, who were very unhappy with the fact that Colin Powell, Secretary of State Colin Powell, had made public reference to new information that the United States had, that Iran was working very hard at mating their Shahab-3 missile with a nuclear weapon. And these were remarks to journalists on a foreign trip that he was taking. Was, of course, immediately generated headlines all over the world. Well, these senior officials of the German intelligence agency were very unhappy because it looked to them like this was a Bush administration policy to lay the political groundwork for war against Iran. And the reason that they were convinced of this was that they said, or the reason they were so unhappy about this, I should say, is that, that they told the foreign office official that they knew all about these documents, which were indirectly being referred to by Colin Paul, because those documents had been given to them by one of their sources, one of the sources of the BND agency. And that source happened to be a member of the Mujahideen i Kalk, which is best known as a, an exiled Iranian terrorist organization, which had been listed as a terrorist organization by the State Department as well as by European countries because of the fact that it had killed American civilians as well as military personnel during uh, the period of the Shah's reign when this organization was against the United States because of its support for the Shah, later had carried out bombings which killed many civilians in Iran after the revolution had taken place. And ultimately, that had served as uh, a tool of the Saddam Hussein regime in its war against Iran. So it was housed 
uh, in Iraq during that entire war. Then after the war, the Mujahideen account became allies of the Israelis. They reached uh, an agreement under which the Israelis would give them various forms of support, obviously financial support, among others. And in return, the MEK, the Mujahideen, Mujahideen account, would do various things, perform various services for the Israelis. The most important being that the MEK would launder, launder, quote unquote, of various uh, pieces of intelligence or purported intelligence that the Israelis did not want to have attributed to themselves. Of course, this would be intelligence that would be aimed at blackening the reputation of Iran, and particularly intelligence that would show that Iran was pursuing a covert nuclear weapons program. So that is the checkered history of the MEK, the people who had delivered these documents to Western intelligence. And that fact, of course, has been systematically covered up all these years. Because had it been known that these documents were turned over by this terrorist organization, this Iranian exile terrorist organization, there would be questions asked, presumably, one would hope, by not just the news media, but by other observers about uh, whether these documents could really be reliable. And here is the punchline of the story about the BND officials and their meeting with this foreign office official. They told him that the reason that they were so concerned was that they did not regard this NEK source as reliable. They used the term doubtful, quote unquote, in describing that source to my, uh, my source, the former foreign office official. So in other words, they didn't trust the source, and they didn't trust that they could rely on the documents that had been turned over to them, which of course then they had turned over to the CIA, to their colleagues at the CIA. And they knew that Colin Powell then was relying on documents that had come from their source, who they regarded as tough. And in a way, clearly this, from their point of view, looks like history is going to repeat itself because you all remember that Colin Powell stand, stood before the United Nations Security Council in uh, March of 2003 and pointed out all of this you know, on, on the, uh, the uh, screen. He, he pointed to all this documentation, all this intelligence, which was absolutely reliable, that showed that the Saddam Hussein regime was going after weapons of mass destruction. And one of the things that was at the center of his case was the, bio, the, the mobile bioweapons labs that were depicted in a cartoon uh, on, in, in the illustration. Well, that information came from a source, an Iraqi source in Germany. An Iraqi source who told his tales of mobile bioweapons labs to officials of the German BND, who then passed those stories on to the US intelligence community, to the CIA. So after listening to these stories for some months, the BND officials who were debriefing this guy began to say, this doesn't add up. He's not telling the truth. And when George Tennant, the chair of the, the director of the CIA, requested from the BND to be able to use the information that they had gotten from this source publicly, the head of the BND wrote back a two-page letter to George Tennant saying, no, you shouldn't rely on this information. It is not confirmed, and you should not use it. Of course, Tennant paid no attention to it, and the Bush administration went on to use that to justify their invasion of Iraq. But from the point of view of the BND officials, it looked like the 
The same thing was going to happen again. The Bush administration, for the second time in less than two years, was going to rely on information from a source that they were doubtful about. And so that is the first part of the story of these documents. 